read the, your Bible from the book of Joshua, chapter 8, we're going to verses 30 through 35 there this morning. And as you turn there, I just want to say, what not you a beautiful day? Today, yesterday was one of those days where you really look at it and say, this is fall weather around here. You know, and in the fall every year, we, we, we always kind of experience this phenomenon, my wife and I especially, but we like to, and it's something everyone usually likes to go and see, and that's the, can you guess what it is? Leaves. The leaves, right? We like to see the leaves change color. It's pretty, aren't they? We were driving up 295 the other day, and Kimberly said, look at that tree right there, it's red. I said, I know, it's the only one in North Carolina. All the other ones are green and <laughs> yellow and stuff. But, you know, talking about when we see pretty leaves like that, they're, they're beautiful. We like to go see them. And it never fails, whether you're here or in the mountains, you like to see the leaves change color because they're just, it's a beautiful sight, right? I've got a picture at the house, I and mean, there's, there's someone on the ground looking up, taking a picture of the leaves changing color. It's just, it's just a pretty picture. But now living down here, we like to drive up some mountains, don't we? You drive up here because when you haven't seen them in a while, you can be amazed at how tall these mountains are. For instance, think about Pilot Mountain when you're driving north on 52. You're driving, you're driving, you're driving, you see this itty bitty little thing off in the distance, and you get closer, it gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and yet it's only mountain around, but it's huge when you get to it. Right? See, growing up in the mountains, I was blown away by the size of all the mountains that were around where I lived. I, I was just uh, always impressed by their size and their majesty. And there's just something about the grandeur of mountains, whether we live near them or not, that speaks to us in some way. They catch our attention. So God's going to use two mountains today in our text to remind us of something that's very important, a truth that we need to remember. The truth that we're not going to be perfect. We're not. Proud of might. And that as humanity, we cannot approach God on our own, but that he has made a way for us, and that way is through Jesus Christ. So if you would please stand with me. Let's look at Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 through 35. Let's see what the Lord has to say here for us. <clears throat> at that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, had it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has welded an iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there, in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel's sojourner, as well as native-born, with their elders and the officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first, to bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Thank you. May be seated. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. God, we thank you again, Lord, that we have your sure word of testimony, Father. Your word that is inerrant, Lord, is infallible, Father, and that it is true for all ages. And what that means, Father, that is not only is it not capable of error, it bears no error. That it, it, and that it will remain the same. Lord, you have said that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, and that is living and powerful, and that when we let it, until the mouth of time we don't let it, it still would get down to the very dividing of bone and muscle. So Lord, I pray today, Father, that you would let your word be in that, Lord. Help us. Let us speak to us, Father, the message that we need to hear. Help us to have the attentive and receptive parts to hear, Lord. I pray that our eyes will be opened, our ears will listen, our minds will comprehend what you're trying to say, but then most importantly, that our heart will take it in and apply it. And I pray for myself today, Lord, just help me to, to step out of the way. You know, I can trip all over myself all day long for a time on my own, and I don't want to do that. I just want to be in the presence of the Master and let you do your work. I pray, Father, that you'll do that today. Just let me be alone for the ride. Lord, just thank you, Lord, for your, your faithfulness to us, Lord. Help us, Father, to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three points we're going to cover today. Real brief points. The first one is the altar on the mountain. In the verse we saw, he talked about an altar being built on the mountain. The second point is the law on the mountain. And then the third is the view from the top of the mountain. You see, I'll be honest with you, today is a very hard sermon to write on this because many commentaries don't talk a whole lot about these 
five verses in Joshua, they just briefly mention that this is what the people of Israel did, and then they move on to the next section. But as you well know, there's not anything in the Word of God that's not there for a purpose. There's a reason for these five verses here today, so I knew that I couldn't just skip over them or I wouldn't be doing justice to what Joshua was trying to tell us. So it's a little bit of a difficult sermon this morning, but I'll do my best as I travel through that, because in our text, we're looking at two mountains. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Now, Mount, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim are about a mile and a half apart from each other in Israel at the top. So you know, the, two, the two peaks of the two mountains are about only a mile and a half apart. And at the base, they're 500 yards apart from one another. Gerizim reaches to approximately 2,895 feet above sea level, and Ebal reaches over 3,000 feet. And both of their names in Hebrew mean barren, meaning that there's not anything that really grows on them. So what's so important then about these mountains? Well, here's some facts about them that are worth considering. From the top of either of these mountains, you can see a whole lot of the promised land. They're, they're that tall. You can see a great view of everything that God had promised that the nation of Israel would inherit. And so, but because they are where they are at, they form what you would call a natural amphitheater. So standing on the tops or the sides of either mountain, you could say something and someone on the other mountain can hear what you were saying. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Not really good for you know, trying to keep something from somebody, you know what I mean? And you can hear each other no matter where you're at. But also, more importantly, if someone was down in the valley, they would hear you also, and vice versa. So it's a natural amphitheater there. <clears throat> so why then is that so important? Well, because God had that set up because he's going to use these two mountains as an object lesson for Israel. They were going to be there, and he wanted to make sure that they could hear what was going to be said. But I want you to consider something else here today, is that the fact that Joshua was being faithful. Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 4 through 7, Moses was given Joshua instructions before Moses died. He said, when you get into the promised land, this is what you're going to do. And this is what he told Joshua. I'll read the verses to you. He said, now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, this is including Joshua, keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And on the day that you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on what? Guess what? On Mount Ebal? And you shall plaster them with plaster. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall wield no iron tool on them. <clears throat> you shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. And you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and shall eat there. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. They've actually found this altar on Mount Ebal of all places. And it's very interesting because there's a lot of bones and such there as, as animal sacrifices would go. But the altar that the stones, the stones that the altar are made out of are all round stones gathered out of the ground. Nothing's been worked on with any kind of a tool. So it's interesting that they have found this altar. So Joshua and the people, after defeating Ai, as we talked about a few weeks back, they kept on their trek northward. They kept going further into the promised land, and they came upon these two mountains. So Joshua, he separated half of the people to be on Mount Gerizim, and the other half on Mount Ebal, and they stood there in the presence of the ark that was carried by the priest. We saw that in our text for today. And if you go further in the passage in Deuteronomy, you see where the people would declare the blessings of obedience on Mount Gerizim. Those half of the people that were on Mount Gerizim would talk about the blessings of obeying the law. And that the people who, who were on Mount Ebal would declare the curse of disobedience while they were on Mount Ebal. But before any of this could happen, Joshua had to do something. He had to fill that ark. I mean, that altar, just as Moses said he was going to do. An altar of earth and stone upon which no tool of iron would be lifted, as the Bible says. And you would say, well, why is that so important that no tool of iron would be lifted upon this altar? Well, it's because it's to remind us that there's no works that we can do on our own to appease God. And so this altar had to be built, but it was built on the mountain of disobedience, Mount Evil. You would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't it ought to be built on the Mount of Blessing? But as we know, everything in God's Word has a purpose, right? I read this a while back. I should share it with a friend. She thought it was very funny. 
But it says, late one night, a burglar broke into someone's house. And he thought that the house was empty, so he tiptoed through the living room. But suddenly, he froze in his tracks when he heard a loud voice say, Jesus is watching you. Silence returned to the house, so the burglar crept forward again. And, and Jesus is watching you, the voice said again. So the burglar stopped dead in his tracks. He was frightened, and, and frantically he looked all around the room. And in a dark corner, he spotted a bird's cage, and in the cage was a parrot. So he asked the parrot, was that you who said that Jesus is watching me? Well, yes, said the parrot. The burglar breathed a sigh of relief, and then asked the parrot, well, what's your name? He said, Clarence. He said, that's a dumb name for a parrot. Sneered the burglar. What idiot named you Clarence? The parrot said, the same idiot who named the Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> Guys, do you believe that Jesus is watching you? Really? Do you believe that he is capable of any time and any place knowing full well? Not only every action that you take, but also the very intent of your heart. So not only does he know what you do, he knows what you're thinking about doing. Do you believe he's capable of that? Well, if you read the Bible and believe the Bible to be true, that's right. right? He, he is fully capable of doing all those things. But the question is, is, why would he do that? Why would he even want to know? Well, there's a couple answers. Number one is the answer is that he loves you. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5, 2 says this, And walk in love. Why should you walk in love? Because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, now there's many other verses in the Bible that talks about God's love for us. But they also talk about what we are to do for others now, and, 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 and that ties in, uh, and that we are to love others as well. Now, the second reason is that God watches us is because that obedience to his commands shows our love for him. Exodus 19, 5. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. Luke 11, 28. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God, and obey it. John 14, 15, Jesus says this, if you love me, what's the rest of that verse say? Keep my commandments, right? God watches over us because he loves us, and his desire is that we all become more like Jesus. But here's the truth. We can't do that on our own, can we? We can't become more like Jesus on our own. We, we would fall all over ourselves. No matter how hard we try on our own, we will always fall short. Israel, when they entered the promised land, needed to be reminded of this. They needed to be reminded that on their own, apart from God, that they could not do anything. And Jesus says to himself in John 15, 5, he said, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Jesus said that he was the vine and that we are the branches. And I don't know about you, but whenever you cut a branch off of a plant or a tree or wherever else, what happens to that branch? It dies. It doesn't keep on living, does it? Do you believe that you can do anything without Jesus then? That's a question that you have to settle in your heart before you can really start following him. Because if you believe that you can do anything without Jesus, you're really not trusting him. And you really can't follow him. And it's also the reason that this altar was built on a mountain where the nation of Israel would read out of the curses found in the law, of the, in the law for disobedience. This altar would remind them that even though they had sinned, because they were not perfect, like I said before, we can't do it on our own, and neither are we, that there is always a way back to Jesus. Point number two, the law on the mountain. You see, whenever we travel, my wife and I, when we travel back to visit our family, there, I, I like to look for landmarks. I don't know about you guys. I like to see what's out there, what's changed. I like to look and see if maybe that building that once was there has been finally torn down, or maybe that store, oh, that store's not there anymore, right? Or I like to, maybe they're building a new house over there. If you drive anywhere and the, the area's growing, you see all new houses being popped up everywhere. You see, but if you ever travel to Roanoke, Virginia, one of the landmarks there is the Roanoke Star. So if you're traveling north on 581, it's up there on a mill mountain, which is on your right. And at night, this star is lit up for the whole world to see. It's a massive star. And it's done so because the star stands for something. It's a reminder of something that is important to those who 
lived in Roanoke, Virginia. See, there was something specific that Joshua and the elders were to do to this altar to really make it stand out. Remember the command from Moses that read, we read earlier in Deuteronomy, Moses commanded that you shall set up these stones concerning which I have commanded you, and you shall plaster them with plaster. So in other words, you're going to build this altar full of stones. If you've not lifted any tool on whatsoever, you pick them up off the ground, you pile them up, you pack some dirt around it, and then you put plaster on them. That's interesting, isn't it? You plaster these stones because you're going to take this little instrument and you're going to write on all that plaster a copy of the law. Why would we want to do that? <coughs> have you ever needed to be reminded of something? Guys, have you ever needed to have your wife to remind you on a Sunday morning that your hair is out of place a little bit? For those of us who still have some hair up there, you know what I'm talking about. Honey, you need to comb your hair before you go out the door. Or maybe your shirt's untucked a little bit. You need to fix your tie a little bit. You ever had that happen, guys? It's okay. You can say yes. I know. You've never had that. <laughs> what about you ladies? How many times have you needed to be reminded that, oh, I'm supposed to meet so-and-so for a lunch at this time on this day? Yeah. Right? You need that all the time. Or that your kids have a dentist appointment later this week. How many times have you had that happen where your phone bings to remind you that you've got an appointment in two days for your kids and you go, oh, I totally forgot about it. That's, that's a good thing about technology to some extent. It can remind you of stuff like that. But the truth is, that's why they make day planners, isn't it? You go about these calendars so you can write all this important stuff down so that you can remember it. You see, on this mountain, this is the ultimate reminder for the people of Israel. Remember that half of the Israelites would be on Mount Gerizim. They would be declaring the blessings that came from obedience to the law. Well, the other half would be over on Mount Debo. Remember, they're not that far apart. So when one was declaring the blessing, the others could hear them. And when one were declaring the uh, curses, the other ones could hear them. So they would be talking back and forth to one another. And this amphitheater would allow everyone to hear everything that's happening. So then on this mountain of cursing, there would be this altar covered with plaster. On the plaster was written the law of God. So what would you say to that? Well, it says this to us, that you cannot approach God on your own. The law is a reminder of what we're not. That you could not keep the law of God. The law written there on the altar would remind us that there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. That was his death and his resurrection that opened the way for us to come back to God from where we had striven straight from him in the first place. That's why the altar was on Mount Ebal, the mountain of cursing, because it was to be a reminder of something that was far bigger than ourselves. That's God. But you got to understand this, you got to consider who Abraham was. Anyone remember Abraham? The good old patriarch from the Bible. Right? Have you ever been at Sunday school? I'm sure you've heard something about Abraham. Good old Abraham, the man who, when God told him to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice to God, Abraham did not hesitate. The Bible says that he got up the next morning and he went on his way with his only, his only son to do just that. And remember the story and all that transpired where Abraham had his knife raised up high and he was ready to strike down Isaac, his son, and the angel of the Lord stopped him. And the angel of the Lord said this to Abraham in Genesis twenty-two sixteen. 16. He said, by myself I have sworn declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, that I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That's what we call an unconditional promise. You know what an unconditional promise is? See, God looked at Abraham and said that because he was faithful and he was obedient, that he would not only bless him with children, but that they would be numerous and that they would eventually rule over their enemies. And this is the last, but the most important blessing that came through this, is that in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The only way that all the nations of the earth could be blessed through Israel was through Jesus Christ. Jesus is an unconditional promise. It's a promise that's given that has no conditions to it because you can't meet those conditions. And Jesus' love for us is the unconditional promise because Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. It's a love that never goes away. But just as there are unconditional promises in the Bible, there's also conditional promises. What's a conditional promise? Well, a conditional promise is something that you can get when you meet the conditions for it. 
It's a promise that will only be fulfilled when certain conditions are met. God promises in his word that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That's an unconditional promise. But yet what happens when we sin? Well, God doesn't really leave us, but he draws far enough away that we recognize that something's missing. We know that there is something missing in our lives. And so for the nation of Israel, God promised that he would not entirely turn away from them. That was unconditional. Yet the kind of lives that they lived in the promised land would depend on the extent in which they lived in light of God's promises, God's commands. So if they wanted to receive the blessings of God in their lives, they had to meet the requirements for those conditional promises. God said, you're my people. I'm going to walk through you forever. But how good your life is going to be is depending on how well you live your life. That's what an unconditional and conditional promise is about. See, that kind of reminds us of today that when we think about it. Just look around you at the state the world is in. If you tell me that it's fine and dandy, if I asked you, say, what do you think about the world? You say, oh, I think it's great. I would say, have you ever watched the news? Have you read the newspaper lately? Are you both blind and deaf? Because the world in which we live is in perpetual chaos. And no, I don't mean just politically either. We live in a world where each one does what they think is right, where the love of their fellow man and neighbor has waxed cold. And the God who was once alive and vibrant, well, he's just really just a figment of your imagination, so why didn't you listen to him anyway? Or worse yet, he never really cared about you in the first place, so why just do what you want? When was the last time you saw your child with a fork about to poke it into an electrical socket? And you said, that's the time, Johnny, do it anyway. Do what you want. Would you do that? I know that's kind of an exaggeration, but you understand, right? If you had said that, things wouldn't have ended well, would it? Little Johnny's hair would have been standing on end. He likely wouldn't have had any left, so he wouldn't be worried about growing up with hair without flesh. Yet that is the voice we hear in our culture today, a voice that says, go ahead and do what you want, because who cares? We should all care, shouldn't we? Because when sin is present, the conditional promises of God are not met, and the blessings stop. So I remember one time when I was working up at the seminary as an electrician and we responded to this house that had an electrical outage. And so when we were there, we traced the problem from a uh, breaker that had tripped to this one particular bedroom. And so while we were in this bedroom, we noticed, first of all, it was a child's bedroom. And so it was messy beyond belief. You know what I'm talking about? Stuff was laying everywhere. And so we had to go around and check all the electrical outlets. And we checked them all to make sure nothing was wrong with any of them, but we had one left to check. And it was behind the dresser. So when we pulled the dresser out from the wall, we immediately saw what the problem was. And do you know what it was? You won't believe it, I'll tell you. A penny had fallen off the dresser and landed directly in between the tongs on the plug for the light in the dresser. So every time they went to turn the light on, they would short out the system and throw the breaker. Right? They guess what also happens to that penny every time they threw the light on? They melt it just a little bit more. There was that penny melted for all its worth onto those tongs on that breaker. And we told them, we said, guys, you got to really clean your house up a little bit. you got to clean your room up a little bit because you don't just know how close you came to disaster. Because if they would have kept turning that light switch on, what would eventually happen? It would eventually would have burned down that room with the kids in it, or worse, the house, or the apartment and all that. You see, I think that same is true for Christians sometimes. Our lives are in a mess, and yet we keep trying to turn the light on, but it keeps going off. The conditional promises of God that we look for just aren't there, and it's because something has messed up the system. And yet, instead of cleaning up the room, we keep flipping the switch trying to make something happen that's just not going to because it's a problem that we haven't dealt with yet. And all the while, not realizing just how close we are to disaster. Which leads to the third point, the view from the top of the mountain. <clears throat> if you've ever been up in Virginia or even in the northern part of North Carolina, you know what I'm talking about when I say the Blue Ridge Parkway. Who knows about the Blue Ridge Parkway? It's a beautiful, isn't it? It runs from, uh, begins at the southern port of the southern point of the Shenandoah National Park Skyline Drive in Virginia at Rockfish Gap, and then it runs to U.S. Route 441 at, I don't know if I can say this word right, Okanal 50? Okanal 50? That's good enough. In the Great Smoky Mountains National Park near Cherokee. So basically, it runs through the mountains. And if you've never driven on it or any portion of it, then let me tell you, it's a beautiful drive, especially in the fall, because you get to see all these leaves changing color. You get to see all these great 
vistas of view and all this beautiful stuff. And on some of these straightaways and twists and turns as you're driving through the mountains, you are on top and you're looking down. You ever experienced that? It's pretty high up there, isn't it? That's what God is giving us here with these two mountains. He's giving us a view from on top. He is reminding us of how he operates. Now, now, do you believe that God has a plan for you? Here's a question. Do you believe that God has a plan for your life? Well, I would say yes. Do you believe that God has certain processes in place that he follows? And what I mean by that, because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, is that God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So if God's not a God of confusion, do you believe that he's an orderly God, that he has things in a process he goes through? Some translations use the word disorder there. Instead of confusion, but it means the same thing. Order implies organization. It implies that there's neatness. Things, when they're in order, are logical and they have a flow to them. So when your house is in order, it looks neat, doesn't it? Unless you have kids, then you're lucky to you know, find stuff in the same room every other day because it moves all over time. Now, we always find stuff somewhere else where it doesn't need to be. But when you, you know what I mean? When you do your best to clean your house, it looks neat. And when you look outside on a bright sunny day, it's peaceful outside, right? Maybe some butterflies are flying by out the window, or maybe the wind is rushing through the leaves, causing them to fall, or they, they kind of blanket your yard in a cascade of colors in the fall of the year, just saying, man, that's beautiful. Or maybe you drive by Doug's house, Doug Richardson's house, more specifically, and he's outside along the yard. Then you know when all that is happening, things are in order, right? Things are well with the world. But the opposite of water is chaos. When a hurricane comes through that with damaging winds and high water, that presents chaos, doesn't it? Nothing makes sense, and all you end up doing is doing your best to weather the storm. See, God is not a God of chaos. He's not a God of disorder, but of peace. And that's what Paul is saying there. So in God, because he is a God of order, he deals with us, guess what? In orderly ways, right? He has a plan. He has a process. Think about it this way. When God provided Christ as his ultimate sacrifice as for our sins, he had a process to go through. For 5,000 years, the Jews had to go through the process of learning what a sacrificial, sacrificial pattern of redemption meant. So that when Jesus finally came, the Jews were well aware that they needed a Savior. They were looking for the Messiah. God was preparing them for that so that they would be ready. See, God does the same for us in our day today lives. He provides for us what we call moral standards. Notice I said there that they are his moral standards, not ours. So here's the thing. God provided the law as a school teacher. The Bible says that to teach us something that we all needed to learn, the truth that we could not keep it. And God's moral law is an expression of his character. It is an expression of what it means to be righteous. And we know that when we get saved, that we have the righteousness of Christ in us. As Paul declares in 2 Corinthians 5.21. But that it is Christ's righteousness that gets us to heaven, not our own. All that makes perfect sense. But in the meantime, we still have God's standards for how we ought to live our lives. I'll put it to you like this. When you are a Christian, you are to think about what it was that made you a Christian in the first place, right? Your acceptance of Jesus' death on the cross for your sins, and then making him Lord of your life. Then you are to live your life according, considering this gift, right? You are to live thankful for what God has done for you. Through thankfulness and obedience and through loving Jesus with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But also, what else did Jesus say? We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus said that the whole law was summed up in these two statements. And although we cannot do that perfectly, not on our own, we know that through Jesus, two things are promised unconditionally. First, we can do anything that he asks us to do. Do you believe that? If God asks you to do something, do you think he is fully capable of helping you to do it? Right? Number two, he is going to make us more like him as we obey him. The unconditional promise of God is that when we have placed our faith in Christ, that he holds us in the palm of his hand and that there's nothing that can remove us from his hand. Our eternity is secure. Our salvation is complete. And here's the conditional part. It's up to us to choose how we live our lives. Do we follow God's moral law? Do we do the things that we know are right to do? 
Because if we don't, God's conditional blessings stop because we've not met the prerequisites for them. His unconditional one is still there. We will always have a home in heaven, but when we are not walking in the light of God's word, his blessings will either slow down or they will stop altogether. And we see that in the nation of Israel today. They will always be God's people, yet God had to deal with them in time and again, and because of their disobedience for them, God stopped blessing them. They are in the state they are today because of God's removal of his blessings in their lives. But one day, God will take them up again, and we see that in the book of Revelation. He will work again with the nation of Israel. So why should the same apply to us? It does because God will deal with us as believers when there is sin that is present and is unaccounted for. The, but the beauty of this imagery given to us in these mountains today, with Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, is that there was an altar to remind the Jews on that day of what it took to get things right with God. And for us, there is always the cross to remind us of the sacrifice that was necessary for God to bring us back to Him. They had the altar, we have the cross. If we only will accept it. And then number two, remember that we have to take up our own crosses daily and follow Him. You know what that means. Do you know what it means to take up your own cross daily? Some people think of that as some burden to bear, maybe some illness to carry, something that they struggle with on a daily basis. But what did the cross mean in Jesus' day? Was it something pretty to hang on the wall? No, in Jesus' day, the cross was a symbol of death. So the more accurate picture then is that just as Jesus gave his life for you, you are to take up your cross and follow him meaning what? It's a picture of your death. Daily to yourself. And Jesus says you are to follow me. It's called absolute surrender. It is something we are all called to do every day. And when we do, we will be blessed beyond measure. That's what the Bible says. So as I close out with this illustration, this is something that I found. I hope it works well for you this morning. It's called the stress test. You ready? This is good. I promise you. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but this is amazingly accurate. The picture that we're getting ready to show here in a few minutes, guys, you got to wait for me, okay? It's two identical, identical dolphins jumping out of the water. Who likes to see dolphins? They're beautiful, aren't they? Two identical dolphins jumping out of the water, and this, te this, this test was used in a case study on stress levels at John Hopkins University. So you know it's got to be good, right? Now I want you to look at both dolphins jumping out of the water just a few minutes when they come up, because these dolphins are completely identical. All right, they look the same, like twins. A closely monitored scientific study of this test revealed that in spite of the fact that the dolphins are identical, guess what? That people under stress would find differences in these two dolphins. So what that means is if you're suffering stress, you're not going to see them as being the same, right? And the more differences that a person finds between the dolphins, the more stress that person is experiencing. So you follow me? You see how the test works? Are you ready for the picture? All right, guys, show me, show me the picture. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that we all have stress in our life, right? On some days it's more than others, and, and that's just life. That's just the way life is. You, you run into traffic jams and all kinds of things. Those, those are stressful moments, but here is the thing. Sometimes it's because of what mountain you're standing on. Because if you think you can come to God with your own standards, then you are greatly mistaken because it's only through Christ and belief and faith in Christ alone that brings salvation. It's through surrender that we come to Jesus. And God uses that stress to prick your heart to tell you something isn't right that you need Jesus. Have you experienced that stress before? But other times we suffer stress because we are living outside of God's will. How many times have you experienced that in your life? You're not doing what God has intended for you to do, and so you experience stress. You see, we all have a choice, and sometimes we choose poorly. More often than not, we do choose poorly. And we'll suffer for it. But God is faithful, and he provides a way through who? Jesus Christ. And then we are reminded that we are to take up our crosses daily, dying to ourselves and following him. So if you would, please stand with me. Every, if 
bow and every eye closed. second question is this, is do you need to come back to him? That's a little bit more poignant in some senses. Do you need to come back to Jesus? Because here's the thing, it's real easy to get away from him, isn't it? It's real easy to get away from Jesus. It gets so wrapped up in our own lives that we lose sight of this moral compass that God has given us. And before too long, we end up feeling that we're lost, that we're just floating out in the ocean with nowhere to go. Because I know we've all been God has revealed that to you here this morning. And then I encourage you to lift your hand. I love to pray for you. Thank you. I pray for you. If no one else raises their hand, then I assume that everything is right between you and the Lord because that's between you and Him. What you do today is an answer for what you believe about Him. More importantly, about yourself. So as Cindy plays on the piano there, a sort of song of invitation. You can open your eyes. You can you can look up, you can sing the song if you want, but this is your time of invitation. This is the invitation portion of the service. It's up to you because the altar is always open up front. If you want to come down and pray with you, I would love to share with you how you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior without a doubt. Or have you come back to him? Just any place. And, and Fran's want to sing. I think that's my part. So everybody go. Double bus. 